And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Tim. So take it away, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Today's topic, as Tom mentioned, is lung care. And can you see my screen? The lawn care slide. Yes, we can see it, Mark. Okay. Just want to make sure before I start. So we are going to talk about lawn care and preparing your lawn for next season. And this is going to be research-based material that I'm going to share with you. And some of the topics that we are going to cover are seeding, fertilization in soil, mowing, dethatching, aeration, weed control, and some of the recommended grasses that are recommended for the Northeast Ohio area. I'm not going to touch on insects because that could be a whole nother presentation by itself. So I'm going to touch on these six items and these will be the core items that I think will help you set yourself up for a green and successful lawn for next season, if you start this year. So the first item is seeding. Seeding is, and overseeding is recommended in late summer, early fall. It's the best time to establish a new lawn. I used to always seed my lawn in the spring, but the last few years, I've been doing it in the fall and I have much greener lawn and better success as a result of that. You're overseeding into thin turf or small patches of bare soil in your lawn. And the best time to do that is late winter, spring or early fall. Why would we see later in the year? Well, the number one reason is there's less competition with weeds. The grass will have two cooling seasons, fall and spring, before the potential for heat stress. We're experiencing heat stress now in July and August when it gets really hot and your lawn wants to start burning out. And think about it in the spring. You see, walk out, your lawn looks really green. The next day you walk out and it's covered with dandelions. So that is just an example of the propagation of seeds early in the year. You don't want to compete with the seeds. You want to establish your lawn later in the year so that those weeds don't have a chance to germinate. In the spring, the ground may be too wet for seed preparations also. I have a very wet yard. It slopes nine feet to the back of my property. And a lot of times in my spring, I can't cut grass until I have a week or two of dry weather because it just gets so saturated. So seeds should come in contact with the soil and have space to germinate and grow. It's not recommended in the Northeast Ohio area to seed later than mid-October. So we still have a little bit of time to get that seed down and once the thing starts cooling off. So we're talking about you know fall uh, to get get that seed germinated. Here's a couple pictures of German, uh, spreading seed. You know your top picture you you have some seed uh, starting to grow. Um, if you get it planted here before October, you you get that grass to start growing because the, the weeds are starting to die off. And a good way to spread the seed is one of those mechanical spreaders on the bottom left and bottom right. You could also use those spreaders to spread fertilizer as well. Uh, it's recommended to use one of those mechanic, mechanical spreaders rather than just go out there and throw it willy-nilly by hand because you don't have a, an easy spread of the seed if, when you're doing it by hand. In, I have one of those spreaders I picked up for, I think, less than $5 at a garage sale. So uh, they're, they're fairly cheap. Fertilizer. What kind of fertilizer should you use? 
fertilization does more to improve poor quality turf and maintain good quality turf than any other practice. Um, soil tests can help determine what kind of fertilizer you need. And if the soil is too acidic, uh, lime could be added to balance your soil's pH. It's recommended to apply lime in the fall or late winter. So you could apply lime um, around the time that you're overseeding as well. You ever wonder what the numbers meant on a bag of fertilizer? There's three sets of numbers. The first number, represented in yellow here, represents the content of nitrogen. The second number represents phosphorus. That's designated in green here. And the third number represents potassium, designated by the blue. And those numbers represent the percentage of those three items by weight. So that 24, 6, 12 shows that there's 24% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, and 8% potassium in that soil. To simplify, it could, could be 1 or 4 Let's just go with four, 24, 4, and, and 8. Um, in lieu of a soil test, a general recommendation for lawns in the area is to, to use that mix of a quarter as much phosphorus and half as much potassium as nitrogen. So the 24, 6, 12 mix would be the general fertilizer mix to apply, shown here. And here's an example of that same mix, um, 16, 4, and 8. Sometimes the nitrogen will be designated by an N. The phosphorus will be designated by a P, and the potassium will be designated by a K. And on the right, there should Showing a hand spreader at some of the nitrogen or the, the fertilizer. <clears throat> and to tell you what those three items are good for, to simplify it, nitrogen helps with the growth of your grass. Phosphorus helps with your roots. And potassium helps make your plants strong. And, and it helps with their, the health of the plant. Now, I talked about soil testing. The essential ingredients of good soil includes the following. Decomposed mineral material, matter, organic ma material, pore space, which consists of air and water, and living organisms. Now, urban soil is affected by the following. Or Horizon, horizontal dislocation and compactness. Now think about when they're, they're building a house. Sometimes they're digging in the ground to build a basement for that house. And that ground that they're digging out deeper in the soil is bulldozed on the property line. So they're disrupting your soil content. So the best way to determine what your soil needs are is to do a, a soil test. As a general rule, soil near the lake is more sandy, and inland in Lake County is, is more clay. But you would need a soil test to determine what your soil are. Now, here's some of the attributes of sandy and clay soil. Drainage on sandy soil is fast. Clay soil is very low. I have clay soil in my yard, so the drainage is very slow. So when I get a heavy rain, it takes a while for my yard to dry out. Water retention 
sandy soil. It's low. It's high. Nutrient holding capacity. Now, sandy soil is low, but there is one advantage here for the clay soil. It retains a lot of the nutrients. Warming and cooling. Sandy soil heats up and cools down fast. Clay soil, it takes a while to warm up and it's slow to cool. So in the spring, when you, you're trying to plant seed, you're, if you have clay soil, it's still fairly cool. It takes a while to warm up. And in the fall, if you have clay soil, it takes a while to cool off. So that's another advantage of planting your seed in the fall. Compaction. Sandy soil, it's either none or low. And clay soil, it's high. So if you take a handful of clay soil, ball it up in your hand, it's going to stay in that ball. Sandy soil, it probably will fall apart. And resistance to root growth. Sandy soil is low. Clay soil is high. So you might want to consider if you have clay soil, if you're old, overseeding, maybe mix in some, some, um, some uh, uh, amendments to your soil for that grass to pop, you know, start growing. Soil testing. Where can you get a soil test? Uh, Lake County Extension Office, which is located on Menor Avenue uh, in downtown Painesville. Uh, they suggest doing a soil test through Penn State Agricultural Analytical Services Lab. And a, a routine soil analysis kit is available at Lake County Extension Office for only $10. And uh, homeowners are responsible for, they, they get to kits and their response for mailing it at their expense. Turnaround time once they receive the, the soil sample is three to seven days. So it's fairly quick. You might want to do that you know, in the fall um, or earlier in, in the year so you get your sample back. And here's it, a link if you are interested, you can go online and, and get the information. It has instructions on there. You take a little plugs from uh, an area and you send it in. You mix it up in a bucket and you send it in. So $10 and the turnaround time is, is only three to seven days. Mowing. Most lawns should be mowed at two inches or above. I had the bad habit of cutting my lawn too short in the past, and as a result, this time of year, I had nothing but brown lawn because it got burned out. You keep the lawn higher, it, it doesn't suffer in, in the drought months. So you mow more often in the spring because you have more growth. And very important, keep your lawnmower blades sharp. You want a nice clean cut cutting when you're cutting it longer. This year I have um, a landscape service cutting my lawn and my lawn is, is doing a lot better because they're cutting it a lot longer than cutting it higher, the blades of grass than what I had done in the past. And, and I'm sure their blades on their lawnmower are a lot sharper. The general rule when you're cutting and mowing, never cut more than a third of the blade of grass at one time. So if the grass is three inches, you only want to cut one inch off at, at a time. It's better to cut wet grass than to wait for it to dry out. If you have a sharp lawnmower blade, um, you'll get it, it'll cut nice. And longer grass shades the soil and prevents weed seed germination. So there's an advantage to keeping it long. long you have less chance for your dandelions and other weeds to propagate in, in your lawn. And here's a couple examples of mowing. And if you look at that bottom left picture, they're cutting at an angle. 
And that's what this landscaper is doing to my lawn now. He doesn't cut uh, straight across like I used to. He cuts at an angle and he alternates on his cuts. Uh, and it, it seems to cut, you know, the health of my lawn is, is a lot greener, uh, especially this time of year. I'm very surprised. And, and that top right picture is showing the lawn being cut, but it's, it's, if you look at that grass, it's, it's fairly long uh, af even after the cut. Thatch management. Thatch is organic matter that forms below the grass stems and above the soil. Uh, what thatch does is it restricts air movement, water and plant nutrients, and dethatching helps remove excessive organic material. It should be performed during cool weather and adequate moisture. Do not remove thatch during periods of high temperature, drought, or in the late fall. So you would not want to thatch this time of year. You would want to do it earlier in the year. And what is thatch? Thatch is some pictures here show some dead material. You, on the bottom, on the left there, you have an automatic thatch machine. Uh, on the top, it shows some thatch in a lawn where it's just sitting there. Um, that needs, should be removed. And then in the middle, in the top right picture, uh, there's a hand thatcher where you basically just drag it across the lawn, get clumps of that dead decomposed material. And on the top right, uh, they have a wheelbarrow and they're just raking it up. It's a lot of work, but um, you might, if you have a large area, I have over an acre uh, of my property. I would probably not want to do it by hand. I would probably rec um, rent one of those audit thatchers. Aeration. Aeration is the process of removing plugs of material from the soil area. Aeration is used to reduce soil compactness and it helps remove thatch. So the process should be performed during cool weather, adequate moisture, so same time as the thatching, mid-spring, late summer, early fall. Uh, aeration plugs should be broken apart once they have dried. And if you look at that picture on the bottom there, uh, it's, it's plugs that, you know, there's a machine that goes across the lawn and, and bring, brings those plugs up. And then you would break those plugs up uh, and it helps with the air and water movement in your lawn so it's not all compacted together. Weed control. Developing a dense property managed turf will help control weeds. Applying herbicides and are recommended to control turf gas, grass. And these chemicals should be applied prior to weed germination in early to mid spring. Now the common misconception with a lot of herbicides is, well, the instructions say to put a quart in for every five gallons. Now if I put in two quarts in for five gallons, I should get twice the coverage and it should work better. No, you should not. You should follow the directions on the package because your they're, they're recommended. You could kill your lawn if you put too much herbicide on there. So follow the directions. It's very important. And here's a couple methods for applying herbicides. Uh, that middle picture has a, um, a little spray pack um, as he's going around in, in spot treating areas. Uh, on the top left there, they have a, an herbicide that you connect to your hose and basically just spray it onto your lawn. And you know, there's on the top right, on the right there, the thing that I'm sure everybody one has in their lawn, uh, dandelions that just pop up overnight. It's amazing how fast they come and, and how 
much they populate. Now, another thing I want to talk about is weed control, too. Um, when I first moved into my property, I used to do a lot of weed control. My one neighbor had a professional lawn service come in, take care of his lawn, but my neighbor to the right of me did not do anything. And as a result, I was at the mercy of all the weed seeds coming over from their yard into my yard, no matter how much I put, how much herbicide I put down. So to counteract that, uh, I, I learned over the few, last few years is to have a thicker, greener lawn. And uh, I use less herbicide and I do more seeding and overseeding. So I have a thicker lawn, so there's less chance of the weeds to propagate. So that's how I, my weed control method, uh, because you know, if you're at the mercy of your surroundings if you're getting weed seeds blowing into your yard from your neighbors. And then the bottom left there, there's you know, a patch of weeds that are, are popping up on the edge of the lawn. You could uh, probably use that spot treatment used in uh, that center uh, spray bottle. Grasses. Some of the recommended grasses for our area. There's cool season turf grasses and um, they include turf type tall fescue, perennial ryegrass, fine fescue, and Kentucky bluegrass. Um, each one of these has characteristics, and I'm going to go through them. And some of these grass mixtures you may get may be a mixture of some or all of these. So I'm going to go through these and show you what these individual grass, the characteristics are. So the first grass, turf type tall fescue. It's, it, it shouldn't say best voice. It should be best choice for organic lawn. Um, new cultivars are less coarse. They're grow, they grow upright. They till more readily, and they're darker green in color. So if you look down there on the bottom left, it's a little thicker. In, as far as organic lawns, you don't have to use a lot of herbicides and pesticides with that. Perennial ryegrass. Um, perennial ryegrass is, is exceptional, exceptional for cold and heat tolerant. So that probably would do a lot better in your July and August months when it's really hot out not recommended to use alone. So you might want to mix that with um, it's suggested here, Kentucky ryegrass. Fine fescue. It grows well in a, an acidic soil or poor soil. So that probably would be a good choice for my yard because I don't have the best soil. My soil is more on the acidic side because it's clay. And the leaf blade is, is fine, just like you shows there. And this turf will dominate shady areas. So I have a lot of this growing in my backyard with it because it's surrounded by trees. And this is one is also frequently mixed with Kentucky bluegrass. Kentucky bluegrass, it requires more than average levels of nitrogen. Nitrogen is probably the most important thing in fertilizer. Uh, it's that first number that I talked about. So you would probably need a lot of nitrogen for this bluegrass. And it can turn brown or go dormant if not irrigated during hot, dry summers. It's considered a high maintenance grass and may not be a good choice for organic lawns. So it, this Kentucky bluegrass would require more nitrogen, probably more watering, 
And since it's not a good choice for or organic lawns, you probably would need more herbicides to keep this lawn healthy. Here's some examples of some grass and, and blend fixtures. Um, selected turf grass, um, tall fescue, uh, if you look on the left there, Kentucky bluegrass, uh, turf tot type tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, and it, it gives some of the characteristics, what they're good for, um, sun or shade, amount of care, and the seeding rates. You have perennial ryegrass. Um, that Kentucky bluegrass looks like it's good, and fine fescue is good for shade. Uh, and then there's different uh, varieties of them as well. Um, so you, and depending on what what you're trying to accomplish, whether you have a shading area, uh, what your soil is like, uh, that soil test will, can help determine. Um, what your choices are for seeding as well. I'd like to share with you some of the sources I used on my presentation, and they include Purdue University, Ohio State University, and Penn State University. Um, these were all my sources. The, the, Material I shared with you was all research-based. Um, when you look up information on grass or basically gardening or anything like that, use a research-based source rather than just um, a, a gardening center because a gardening center may um, give you misinformation. It's always best to use research-based materials from a, uh, use a EDU extension when you do your search. And um, I'd like to share with you a little lawn humor. So I met a guy the other day who said he's a diamond cutter. And then he went on to tell me he mows the lawn at the Yankee Stadium. And it's attributed to any young men. And that concludes my presentation. I'd like to thank you.